To guard us in all peace this holy day and all the days of our life. Master, Lord God of Andhukratur, the Father of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything and concerning everything and in everything. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to yourself. Spirit has supported us and have brought us to this hour. May that God may have mercy and compassion upon us, hear us, help us, and accept the supplications and prayers of his saints, for that which is good on our behalf at all times, and to keep the life and standing of our honored Father, the Pope and Patriarch of Atavajus II, and his partner in the Apostolic Ministry, our Father, the Bishop of Acrolos, and forgive us our sins. Lord, have mercy. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, grant us to complete this holy night and all the days of our life in all peace with your fear. All in me, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men, the rising up of enemies, sit it and manifest, take them away from us. From all your people, from this holy church, from this your holy place, by those things which are good and profitable, do provide for us. For as you have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and upon all the power of the enemy, lead us. She's so worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Before I just do a quick introduction, can we all move up? Why is everybody like, come on, it's MTC. No, we, all, we all grew up remembering Sayyidina very well. We shouldn't be intimidated. Just everybody move up. Come on. We can all be bunched together. Get together. Everybody come close. Of course, it's always a joy when we have uh, Sayyidina and Bakrullah coming and visiting us. Uh, I always say it's not often enough. Huh? So, uh, 
we're very happy that he's come with us and uh, agreed to come and clear his busy schedule. As you know, with each coming year, Sayyidna gets more and more responsibilities. And uh, the fact that he was able to clear up his schedule for these two days with us is, is a great blessing. And actually, even more than that. So he's going to be yeah. with us, as we explained. He's going to be with us tonight. And tomorrow he's going to spend the whole day with us. And then Sunday he'll pray the liturgy. And he's also going to be speaking at the servants' meeting. So it will be a great time for all of us to spend this valuable time with Sayyidina. As always, Sayyidina uh, is a great teacher. And I was just telling him right now in the servants' prep, you know, uh, we've, all of us priests all over the U.S. now are benefiting from him and his teachings to us. He teaches a lot about church history, the fathers, and all the great things about our church. And I hope that all of you guys also get the same benefit. So uh, I'm not really sure exactly what, what the schedule of today's topic within the, the adulthood theme. Is that, is that still on? Or? All right. So uh, Sayyidna, let's uh, thank you so thank much for gracing us. Thank you for the welcome. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. May the Lord bestow upon us his grace and his blessing. Now and ever into the ages of all ages, amen. Um, I think there are so many talks in the next couple of days. Uh, just if I start speaking about the wrong subject, let me, let me know so we can adjust. No, but God willing, I will speak about um, very interesting and appropriate uh, topic for most of you. I know that a few years ago, this, this topic was on my mind for a good year um, because there are some things that... Uh, repeated um, yeah I would like to see that. this way you can all be in the cameras <laughs> they can bring one camera from here too so. Um, <clears throat> what, did, what do they call your generation now? Do you have a term yet? Are you Z? I thought they went to Alpha. You're what? You're Alpha? Okay, so 1996. So the interesting thing about this, like when we were growing up, they didn't have terms for <laughs> generation. Uh, I think the first one is Generation X, right? X, and then they did Y, and then um, yeah, after the baby boomers. But they started to notice something uh, in, in between the last two generations. It's something called micro-generations. Have you heard of this? That actually a generation is supposed to be a generation, 40 years, 50 years, or, or, or larger, right? That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, these things will not pass away until this generation. Um, <clears throat> or take place till this generation uh, passes away. But now they notice that because of technology, because of uh, how close things are, globalism, that um, generations and differences, large differences between what should be within one generation is taking place. So that's why they're not exactly sure what to do with you. Uh, <laughs> no, they do. It's not your fault. It's the world's pressure on you. And they actually, what I tell um, a lot of the servants, uh, and now you're starting to serve, is that um, the generations are getting smarter and smarter, and they mature quicker and quicker for the most part. <laughs> but if they want to <laughs> mature. And I think that's what the focus here is, because you start to see a big divide on people who are, you know, 20-year-olds when they are 11, um, and then you start to see the opposite uh, as well. Um, so, <clears throat> I want to start by speaking uh, about a, a, a problem on a micro and macro level, which is lying. There was uh, several studies that were published the last few years um, on how often people do not tell the truth. Uh, one study says a, a person on average tells two lies a day. Another similar study said 13 times. Um, and there were some professors that have been trying to figure out exactly why this is the case. 
They, they said also by most children, by the time they reach the age of four, that 90% have learned the concept of lying. By, by, by the time they can put a good sentence together, <laughs> they've already figured out uh, how to do this. And this, the prevalence of lying has increased at an alarming rate. Um, some people, they did say that they do not lie at all, uh, but they found even when they do surveys, a lot of people end up lying and they admit that they lie <laughs> to the people that, that conduct the surveys. You know, why would someone lie in a survey? And some people with good intentions, they want to give the answer that the person who's doing the survey is looking for and they kind of respond in, in that sense. Um, so most of the people lie some of the time and few of the people lie most of the time. But in general, we find out that this is very common. What do we lie about? What, what do you think? Is it on here? I don't know why they're sitting. Huh? What do you lie about? <laughs> okay. What's more at the top? <laughs> Just trying to answer that. <laughs> trying to... Yeah, some people uh, lie about age. Some people lie on their resumes about their experience. Uh, their interests. Um, I know some people, they would change their resume depending on who they're applying to to make it seem like that they are better suited for this organization. We rely on our relationships. Um, they say uh, by the time you meet someone new, within the first uh, 10 minutes, most people lie two to three times because you're trying to, or exaggerations, whatever you want to call it, um, to try to put their best foot forward. Um, and again, when we come to ask and say, why? Why do people do this? Um, we lie to people that we care about as well, uh, friends and family, um, so probably not to upset themselves, or to try to make ourselves look better, to try to be nice, uh, avoid confrontation. Um, there's a lot of protection here. Uh, that we do. But in this list, do you notice a common theme? Like what's... Should I ask you more questions? So you can... This is the college. <laughs> do, do you, uh, do your professors ask you to answer questions? Or do they just lecture? Clickers? We didn't have clickers. It's something new. Is it, how many choices do you get? Because next time I'll bring clickers. <laughs> that's a, that's the, the key. But you don't talk normally, because I remember we could be. Okay, which classes do you talk in? Communications. <laughs> You're going to have to. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I've noticed the difference when I go to college campuses, depending, because we have some campuses that are mainly medicine, pre-med, so they don't. <laughs> the ones that are social science, in, in my, um, at UCLA, they were divided on different campuses. So South Campus is very different than North Campus. Um, so and that's a, a different experience you'll have. It's almost a different uh, school. But what's common that you'll find about this? Usually it's about us more than about other people. We lie about ourselves for our own benefit. We lie to other people also, uh, sometimes for self-protection, or sometimes to uh, help others, and sometimes to hurt others. Um, so these are all the different uh, reasons that people uh, may find to lie. Um, but I want to speak about what's related to this is that sometimes we lie to our own selves. And it's much harder um, or much more difficult thing when you're talking about lying to someone else for our own benefit and lie to myself or to deceive myself. Why would someone want to deceive themselves? Continue. <laughs> so let, me, let me find it. I think I put 
there's an updated one. You're not getting all of the... Uh, a higher self-esteem. But if you're deceiving yourself, how does that work? Because technically, when you're deceiving yourself, you're not really conscious about what you're doing, but then you are. Like, that's the whole point of self-deception. You kind of lose the sense of your own reality. But why would someone do that to themselves? Yeah, about, yes, yes. <coughs> yes, so there, there are some fears. Yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> I hope they know what you're saying. But, but um, yes, uh, it's, it's you, you are afraid of accepting certain things in reality. So intentionally, you change that reality so that you think you can function better. And sometimes it works, but to a certain point. And I want to talk about, um, uh, we'll share with you a few different scenarios when we do that and why we do that. Um, it's as old as Plato. Plato lived a long time ago. Um, but it also comes up in different ways. Uh, this habit of self-delusion, which they call it the worst uh, type of habit that you can have. There's different ways that we lie to ourselves or deceive ourselves uh, to make us uh, at ease that we know what we're doing, we're in control, we understand everything, we are right, we are correct, and every other problems are related to other people. <laughs> and whatever was in the past, I can do better uh, because I really am, you know, great. <laughs> in different ways. For some people, it just looks in external realities, right? Like what we look like doesn't really affect, it doesn't really affect, right? Um, <laughs> there's different types of deception. There's a physical, wasn't, it wasn't that funny. <laughs> I was going to do more, but then I said, no, this is a serious group, so we're not going <laughs> to. And Sandra sent me a whole bunch, <laughs> but I didn't understand half of them, so I didn't include them. The, the virtu the, there's virtue deception, which is more dangerous, right? Because it's about purity, about wisdom, like I convince myself, yes, I'm very wise, I know what I'm doing, or that I'm very humble, <laughs> right? And, and the, the Lord has anticipated this and given us much advice in regards to this virtue deception. Because if I think I'm holy, right, with the holier-than-thou attitude, what happens? Why do you call someone holier-than-thou? Did they teach you this phrase? There, there's something when they say, when someone feels like they are just, you can't really, I'm, I'm holier than everyone else. And so, you know, you're kind of arrogant. And you treat other people when I think I'm holy, <laughs> right? But when I know that I'm a sinner, right? And I'm just, I'm like everyone else, if not worse. Then how do you treat other people, right? Go for it. <laughs> right? It's hard for you to accept. Uh, anything that doesn't belong to you. So that's why even in terms of self-deception, it causes us to act and to live and to react differently to other people. Um, so sometimes we say, well, it's not going to hurt anyone, right? Uh, uh, I'm not going to hurt anyone. Um, but, but actually, um, self-deception in its early forms, like that first picture that you're enjoyed. <laughs> it's not, he's not hurting anyone, really. right? But when it develops and gets much worse, then we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. And we end up to put other people in danger or hurt other people in different ways and not realize it. That's why I, I want to I think this, this part is uh, very important for us to understand who we are. Some people call this the uncensored chapters in our lives that we want to kind of cover up. Now in college, I will admit, like, you're, it's a little early for some of this self-deception, but it starts to be very um, tempting <laughs> in uh, this time in your life, and give it another 10 and 15 years. It's just like blood sugar. If you have <laughs> controlled it very well <laughs> at a young age, so you, you, have the, you have formed the good habits, right? But if you're uh, an 
in normal Egyptian households <laughs> with certain eating habits, okay, at a certain age, you're going to have to change your lifestyle a little bit. And so that's why uh, when we ask, why do we deceive ourselves? There's at least three. I'm only going to talk about three different ways we do it and why we, why we could deceive ourselves. You mentioned one, but there's a couple others. Yeah, this is a question. Because <laughs> I know when they say repeat the question, that means, okay, I didn't phrase it properly. But why would we, dis why would we uh, do this to ourselves? Actually, I did have... Okay. What? So it could be unintentional, and there's an intentional one. Um, let me make it easy for you, just because we're going to have to explain these and, uh, a little bit more and elaborate. There's one when I redefine what truth is completely. We'll speak about that. There's another one that's a shameful truth where I cover up reality so that, because uh, there's, there's shame involved usually in the past, could be something in the present, or I'm afraid about something in the future, so that's why uh, I, I have to uh, work on this reality. And there's a third type, which is actually something good, and positive in our life that we also, and that's the hardest one, so bear with me. Some, um, some people have experienced the first one. Most people deal with the second. The third one, and like I said, maybe it's, it's still early for you, uh, but even if you have it, many people don't realize it. Someone has to pretty much wake them up with it, uh, but it's... it's uh, I remember reading about it. It's very powerful. Um, <clears throat> so one, day we, one way we do this is we delude, delude ourselves about the way we look. But thinking and believing these things to be true, the problem is not that I see something that doesn't, is not real, is not true. The problem is that I believe that that's what I look like <laughs> and that this reality is the truth. And anyone who comes to say otherwise, I don't just disagree with them. I may attack them and hurt them. That's the problem that happens afterwards. It's what um, I thought I turned, uh, discovered this term, but I didn't. I, <laughs> when I looked it up, it seems other people have used this. It's called the Herod Complex. Have you heard of this term? Okay, so I did invent it. No. Um, Herod, Herod, there's several Herods in history. There's Herod the Great, the one who uh, killed the 144,000 innocents in the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. They call him the Great because... He built most of ancient Jerusalem. And even many of the structures that he built are still there today. The largest structures, if you ever go and visit in Judea, were uh, built by him, and he was very powerful. That's why, why did he kill the 144,000? Because one of them, there was just rumors circulating that one of them may be the king of Israel. I, mean, I don't think any ruler, <laughs> even if you killed one or two infants, <laughs> on the past, and even logically think about it, like he is, you know, in, uh, he, he, he was uh, not a young man, and uh, if someone who is just born is going to come to power, probably in his 20s, chances are he was not going to live. You say, okay, for my children, even when his children came, it was his uh, his grandson, <laughs> was this Herod Antipas, which was in the time of the apostles. And Herod Antipas, which is actually, when I tr thought I'd coined the term, it was referring to this uh, passage in Acts, when <clears throat> um, he was trying to inflict his uh, authority on other people, um, and they wouldn't listen to him, but those who he convinced, they tried to appease him and tell him, you know what, when you, when you say your words to us and give your speech, you are like a god. And he began to believe this. He was very happy that these people finally realized that I am, yes, I am a god. <laughs> like the people you read about. Uh, and I am your king. And we know from the book of Acts, after this discovery or this desire, the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and was eaten by worms and died. That's the end of Herod the Great's grandson. Herod the Great, do you know what happened to him? 
after he killed the 144,000, you don't hear about, we know that the Holy Family escaped, right? To, and fly to Egypt, good days for us. <laughs> but what happened to Herod the Great after he killed the 144,000, he developed this very strange sickness um, that caused him great pain. Even some uh, physicians are trying to figure out what it was. He was in so much pain that he began to stab himself uh, so that he could die because he would rather die than experience this pain until his nephew sta stopped him from stabbing himself so he had inflicted more wounds <laughs> uh, to, to his injuries. And then shortly after, uh, he did die. This is what happened to Herod the Great after killing the 104th, like imagine, he put a plan in place to try to control the universe. doesn't matter who is uh, affected by all of my, the desire for my, to keep my own power. And in the end, it was short-lived. The same year, 4 BC. The same year, as you see, uh, it was Herod Antipas, three years reigning. <laughs> so even Herod the Great, he had a little bit longer time to be king. What is the point of this? Say, well, this has nothing to do with my life. Actually, in different ways, when we re redefine our truth, as St. Paul says, when uh, they will c there will come a time, the time is very close, where people will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. We are not in any of <laughs> this. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control. All of these descriptions which St. Paul is giving us is related to this deception, self-deception. Because all these people are not consciously, uh, say, if you say, no, you love yourself, you say, no, 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 I don't. I just, you know, take care of my things. Um, I'm not proud. I don't blaspheme God. There's just some things I don't believe in. They'll have an excuse and response for everything that we may, or someone, or God, or the scripture may tell them that this is true, but they will not be able to accept it. That's why what happened to Herod the Great and his grandson was there was no one else <laughs> to be able to affect or influence them. So God and the angel of God, they took action. Just like, I don't know, uh, this what St. Paul is describing, the Epicurean philosophers, you know, when it's mentioned in the scripture, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, there are some people in college campuses that this is their uh, motto in life. Just enjoy life. And that, because that's what life is about, right? So they have recreated <laughs> their own. One time I had uh, one of the youth, and I was trying to, I was a new servant. So I said, you know, why, why don't you, how come you're not coming to church? Why don't you? He said this phrase, eat, drink, and be merry. He said, isn't that in the Bible? <laughs> I couldn't believe that he was, he was serious. So I told him, do you know the verse that comes right after it? <laughs> he said, you fool, for this day your soul will be required of you. So he took the verse, and yes, it's a verse in the Bible, but he, it's half a verse in the Bible. Or what the devil did to the Lord Jesus Christ in the Mount of Temptation, he's quoting scripture, but he's, uh, warp, he, he had deleted and twisted the scripture. So even when it comes to the Bible, uh, that there is a redefinition even of what is in the Bible. And uh, I mean, this is not our, we're not, giving apologetics. I know Abuna wanted me to speak about apologetics. But even now, when sometimes the Bible is very clear about a certain subject, and it could be about anything. I'm not just only talking about the social subjects. But it would be very clear, and then people will make the Bible say the exact opposite because that suits their privilege. And we're like, that's how, how can someone rationally, and why, even do this? Uh, but this is, this is what we are dealing with when we redefine truths or to exchange the truth of God for a lie. Like, the truth of God is very clear. I will say, no, no, no. This is not really what the Bible means. <laughs> and I will redefine the truth to suit my own principles. And usually when that happens, because it happens to some of us, that that's when we stop reading the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't make 100% sense, or it's not really suitable for this generation. Or, um, you know, it's meant for a different time <laughs> and a different people. But I understand what God wants from me. And I understand how God want, will judge me. What Isaiah the prophet said, those who call evil good and good evil. 
But what St. Anthony said, it's that they will turn everything upside down. And the people who are doing good, they will be the odd ones. Whereas before, the people who are doing something wrong, everyone is like, what are you doing? This is wrong. This is not what God wants from us. And it's very clear. Um, <coughs> Uh, this is the phrase uh, that St. Anthony said. So they will go mad. And they will see someone who is not crazy and they say, what's wrong with that person? <laughs> so uh, this is, these are the times. <laughs> this is the, uh, the, the Herod complex, which is very dangerous, like I said uh, in, in the beginning, because usually it ends up in afflicting pain or uh, authority on other people in a very difficult way. The second type, which is the most common, is the shameful thing, the shameful truths, what I, we call the Adam complex. I didn't term this, uh, uh, but that's what is the most common, where we feel that um, the truth is so uh, shameful that we have to lie and deceive other people to cover up something that we have done in the past. To lie about that or what is existing in the present uh, so to prevent something that we anticipate in the future. It's also what uh, you take in psychology, one, one, something in psychology. Projection. What's projection? Exactly. The defense mechanism so that the, the anger or frustration is on others. It also relates to insults, like say someone person A calls person B a fool, right? That can be a projection of what? The feeling, the insecurity that I don't really know what's going on. I'm not really that wise or that knowledgeable. So in order to prevent that discovery from someone else, I will uh, insult someone as a defense mechanism. Or sometimes people spend a lot of time and energy arguing, especially on the internet these days, about things that are not really that important. Uh, but the point is not that this issue that we are debating for weeks or months or days or hours is important. What's important at the end? That I am right and that my opinion is superior. And because my opinion is superior, therefore I am superior, <laughs> and I am right. That's the whole, it's a whole, it's a whole uh, uh, effort and energy to uh, cover up my own insecurity, to satisfy myself so that I can say, you know, I'm really good. Um, we deal with this even in theology these days, what I call the Facebook theology generation, which is the, um, we'll talk about it another time. <laughs> um, so even what Adam did, right, out of his shame uh, and his experience, to shift the blame onto Eve. Like, wh why are you, why are you uh, talking to me? She's the one. Right? And that was the start of the, the division that we have. Um, <clears throat> but there's another type. And this is where, uh, like I said, maybe if you haven't experienced this, Wait a few years. <laughs> it's what we call the Jonah complex. Um, so we could deceive ourselves about the truth that is in us. So Jonah was called to do work. And not just a job. He was not just given a job to do. This is the reason why Jonah was created. right? To go to the people of Nineveh, to preach the gospel there and do, do the work. right? And we know that we read as when we're fasting... Where, which, where, where did he, what did he decide to do? Not, he just didn't leave. He, he, he did leave. He went the opposite direction twice the distance. <laughs> so it's not just saying no. <laughs> like this is very deliberate. Like, and maybe to, okay, to ignore and just sit there would have been fine. But he said, no, I'm going to get it. I'm going to go. Just to make sure. Because even if somehow I end it, it's going to take me longer. I'm not going to get to do it. Like if you're going to destroy them in a certain number of days, by the time I come back, there's no time. <laughs> like he, <laughs> he had really thought about this. Um, this, com this is the fear of success. Like usually most of the time, and especially in, in uh, the Adam complex, we are afraid of failure. Or we are shame because of failure. 
But in Jonah complex, we are afraid of success. The potential that we have to succeed or the fear of that great accomplishment. Some people in high positions are plagued by this on a regular basis. That's why I said, you know, college students, you do have some college students today. Yes. <laughs> Devil's advocate. <laughs> no, no, keep, keep going, because maybe I can figure, you can figure it out. Okay. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm waiting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it's that uh, sometimes this fear uh, out of, well, I guess the question would be this. So why would someone be afraid to succeed? Hmm? It's, a, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of uh, effort. Jonah, it's easier to sleep in the boat, go on a cruise, than to like go <laughs> preach and fast. And pray. Yes? What, what is there to lose? Okay, okay, very good. So there is a fear of not being able to maintain that success. Or what they call in graduate school, uh, which is uh, imposter syndrome. Have you heard of this? First time I learned it was in graduate school last time. Was like, I don't know how I got into the school. <laughs> exactly, everyone else seems smarter and works harder. And I'm here struggling. And everyone seems it's very easy. So maybe they made a mistake, but... Uh, I'm just going to pretend <laughs> that I know exactly what I'm doing <laughs> and continue and try hard, but at the same time, you know, uh, it's misery, right? Because I, I don't think I really belong. And it turns out that many graduate students have this experience. Uh, that's why they tell you, they should tell you <laughs> before you get into graduate school. Uh, but that requires a lot of energy and effort because if I think, you know what, this is a mistake, I'm not supposed to be here, it's easy for me to to leave. But if no, I'm called to this, and I'm supposed to do this, I do need to extend that effort. There, there is a chance that, yes, I might not succeed. It's not just a fear of failure. You found... Yes? So that's the question. That's the question that, that um, I don't, don't have too much time, but I will give it briefly. In our life, uh, we were talking about it just in the last meeting, um, that we are created uh, f for the will, to do the will of God. But that will of God for each one of us, yes, in general, is holiness and live a life of sanctification. But we also have a specific call. And it requires that discovery with a clear voice of God in our life. Sometimes, because we're so distracted by many other things, we don't hear the call very clear, and we're, we uh, go in circles <laughs> because we didn't hear or respond to that call. And sometimes, it's because of self-deception that I may have heard the call, but I'm suppressing the call. That's what Jonah tried to do in the boat. He didn't want to hear. The waves, okay, waves, waves, no problem. I'm going to go down. Uh, they still hear noise. I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> And it didn't work. They said, what are you doing? Like, there's no way <laughs> you could have not noticed that we are in a storm. <laughs> We're sailors and we are worried. You're just here for, for the day. So when they wake him up, he says, okay, I know what the problem is. <laughs> he said, what do you mean you know what the problem is? And these mariners didn't believe in the same God. They believed in different things. But they didn't have the God of Israel that, that Jonah did. So when they start to hear him, they panicked, right? Non-believers panic. What do you mean you did this against God? How could you do this against God? Uh, so Jonah said, don't worry, don't worry. I have a solution. Just throw me. Said, what, what do you mean throw you? <laughs> like, first of all, Jonah, if you want to go, why don't you just jump? 
<laughs> Why do you need them to throw you? But it's very conscious. Yeah, the waves were very hard, so maybe he didn't want to hit the boat. Like if he, if he, if he jumped in the boat. But that's not the reason. The reason is because he knew that, that God, who was using this as a form of discipline to get Jonah to do what he needs to do. And the people that were going, the mariners, they, didn't, they were not responsible. They were facing the same threat because of Jonah, who was not obedient to the will of God. So he said, to relieve them of that, you throw me, you have nothing to do, God will deal with me on my own. If he wants to take me, he takes me. If he wants to save me, he knows that God is going to have him do the work. <laughs> so, so <clears throat> very, very, the will of God for him was very deep inside. And I think we do know it. At, a, at your age, you probably have a good sense. But the rest, sometimes we take some years to come to terms with it to accept, to start doing that hard work. But, but there's a lot of fear that's oppressing it because we're afraid of other things, not just of success. What are we afraid of? And usually at a younger age. That's why we don't hear it. Can anyone? Huh? Tension? What type of tension? There's tension. Attention. Uh-oh. <laughs> we can be afraid of attention. Um, but there, it's, it's, there's other... So usually at a younger age, <clears throat> uh, when, we, when we know the will of God, or when God is calling in this way, like we were just talking about St. Paul upstairs, everything in your life changes, including for him, so for him it was his name, it was his occupation, it was his family, it was you know, the day, daily life, it was how he would die. Everything changes. When you're young, it could be your friends, right? Uh, when you want to go to church more and serve more. But, but my friends are here. My life is here. And be like, no, no, no. This is God calls you to these things, not to those things. Say, but I don't want to lose all of these things, <clears throat> right? Not just time and energy. But what if they know, like, really to follow the will of God could be drastically different than what I'm working on right now in my life. And it's that shift, that change, that sometimes is too devastating for us. So we'll postpone or ignore or reject. <clears throat> and it's not just for the apostles, just for the bishops and the priests, but it's for all Christians because it is standing against the world. And how we stand against and how we do what God wants us to do, that's what I'm saying. That's why it's so unique to each one of us. I can't give you an equation. It needs a, relation, a, a regular relationship for, to unpack all of those things. You want, the first question you ask is why? Why me? Why not him? <laughs> why not her? Why not later? <laughs> so, so there's a period of rejection, but it needs that conversation to, exam to explore, to understand more. And some of the questions are not answered till later. Because God told uh, St. Paul, to use him as an example, or Jonah, he didn't explain to him what he was going to do, everything with the Ninevites, or what all of the Gentiles were going to react to him. He didn't give him the mess. So not all of the answers uh, are given to us. And that also puts us uh, kind of at ease, uh, uh, not at ease, right? Like Abraham, when God called him, he said, okay, go. Leave your family, leave your country, and just go. And it's one of my favorite passages because he doesn't tell him where to go, <laughs> how far to go, when to stop, what are you going to do when you go? <laughs> None of that is there. None of it. It's just go. <laughs> leave this, and I'm going to tell you later on what you need to do. And I would say, like, Someone tells you to go, and then you get in your car. The car's on. You have gas. <laughs> or you have to leave the city, so you go to, sh go to the airport. <laughs> you what are you going <laughs> to... You're not. It's not. And it's not just him. You have, he has some people with him. <laughs> so it's, it is a very difficult situation, right? And they're going to say, well, God, God told you to do what? <laughs> he said to leave. <laughs> we have to We have to leave. <laughs> 
<laughs> and when you ask for more and more information, they say, just, <laughs> I, I, know, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so it's very, right? You won't, if, if one of your relatives <laughs> tells you to do something, you're not going to listen. You'd be like, like, uh, <laughs> um, so we sometimes ignore the will of God and sometimes uh, even in the interim we waste time and energy we prefer to do something to keep our minds off of the spiritual things right? I know I should be doing something else but you know uh, I need to relax and enjoy all the stress I always say in college if you think you're stressed now <laughs> wait a few years you get into graduate school in graduate school you think it's just, just wait wait till marriage and wait till children and wait till finance wait till like there's so much coming <laughs> not to make you feel very <laughs> overwhelmed but to see really like you say I wish remember the days in college <laughs> when you had you had hours yes you didn't sleep much but that's because you didn't want to sleep <laughs> and you wanted to do uh, different things during the day so you can stay up at night and study but life, um, when it calls, there's a lot of things that we are not focused in our call and our mission. You say, but I still haven't figured it out yet. Right, because it needs some time to invest, to, to be with our Creator, to hear that voice. Because we could be asking for a lot of things that are not really that important. Uh, they seem very important to us right now. But, but we also need to spend more time investing on asking God, what do you want me to do? And for sometimes, for many years in our life, that is the question. What do you want me to do? Not just with this problem, but with this picture. Sometimes you will be very spiritual and you say, okay, I have to decide for the school, I have to decide this, marry this person, not marry this person, what to do in this problem. And you spend that time and energy and fasting and praying and putting on the altar, and God will reveal to you this big, big picture. You see, but I'm not talking about the big picture. I, I have this. He said, yes, I know that problem. That problem we'll take care of. But I don't know the next time I'm going to get for you to be this focused and with me. So I will reveal both. Yes, you, have a, you remember? No, no, no. <laughs> I, was <laughs> you know the end. I know you know the end. <laughs> Go to the top. He, he, he didn't die immediately, he died a few days later, but yeah, he repented in between. The devil deceived him. The devil deceived him. But, but that story they would tell to the monks, because when we are trying to assess the will of God, we have to consult with our father confession. He hid this because the, the demon who deceived him, he told him, don't tell your father confession, he's going to tell you no, don't come with me, he's going to be jealous, because you're going to tell him you're going to heaven, he wants to go to heaven, he's not going to let you do it. So don't tell him. So they would use this story. This happened, and it wasn't one of the monks. It's a true story, and they recorded it. Um, <clears throat> so it would be an example. <laughs> it would be an example to the to the monks and to us how that we use the guidance, spiritual guidance, in assessing what is God's will. Especially if, if there's an angel or appears to you <laughs> and tells you something about the will of God, double check, because I know many times. Uh, we will see this and we'll, we'll verify, we'll say yes, we'll, this, this is seen, yes, clear. And many times you're like, no, this is not, this is not God fast or pray or do this, and then it goes away. So, <clears throat> it, if there's a vision, <laughs> let Abuna and Abuna know, or one of the spiritual guides. Uh, but um, normally, normally uh, there's uh, different things that we do to hear the will of God. Um, other people, after a while of wasting time and energy, they just go into uh, the blame game. And they will not happy with their life and their condition because why? 
they are unfulfilled. Why are you unfulfilled? Okay, okay, maybe it doesn't happen in college. After some people in college, some people in graduate school, some people after you have the career, you're like, this is what I was working for for 20 years. So there's a lack of fulfillment. The reason for the lack of fulfillment is because I haven't been answering that original call. And I won't be, um, have that joy. It will be more in frustration, rebellion, defiance, sometimes <coughs> in fear uh, or, or being a slave to someone or something else. Um, and, and the important thing is that how we get out of this blame and this pit uh, is by following, this is very easy, <laughs> following that call and that, um, that work that God asks us to do. As St. Cyril of Alexandria says, even for the desperate, stubborn, and completely in the grip of obduracy, or going against uh, something, the Word of God is quite capable of succeeding in forming attitudes and persuading people to learn the things that make a person wise. The, the Scripture is very powerful, and God is very capable of helping us and lifting us no matter what state we are in. Whether we are like Herod, <laughs> whether we are like Adam, whether we are like Jonah. Because the important thing is how to discover the truth. Because for uh, self-deception, it's a prison that we have imprisoned ourselves in. And instead of being kings and queens and free with the power that God has given us, we become pawns to a false reality. And that, that's the problem with what happens. Usually in this, uh, there is a lot of negative self-talk. Have you heard of this? Psychology? Yes? Not yet? Okay. The negative self-talk, which some of you, and it usually happens when you're young, very young, right? I'm not good enough for this. I'm the worst person. I'm going to fail. Other titles that other people have told us, or sometimes people are telling us the opposite. When someone says something good to us, what do we do? Uh, yeah, and what? Yes, yes, it's not really true. I know the truth. I know I'm really bad. <laughs> And a hundred people can tell you, it doesn't matter how many times or how many people. And so that's why this is part of that dis destru inner destruction, inner prison that happens to us. And we won't be able to find what God's will and call and the goodness if we imprison ourselves in this way, right? Because God is speaking, even sometimes strangers <laughs> will tell you the truth, uh, uh, and especially if you're escaping from something like Jonah, <laughs> God will send you many mariners, <laughs> many people to say, well, why don't you just do this? Very simply. Because God speaks th in many ways. <clears throat> uh, so, so this type of negative self-talk needs some work and needs some correction, not just by positive self-talk, but also by how to reframe and reassess the truth. Um, <clears throat> and for us, like in order to become mature, to, uh, which is the main focus I think we'll t talk more about tomorrow, hopefully, <laughs> uh, it's really understanding this light. Because um, I know like it's early for some of you, but this uh, call, what Jonah was afraid of was the best thing uh, that God had given him. And he was afraid of that. That's why no matter what he did, you ask him after you have an interview with Jonah, he's with us, you tell him, okay, I need to know. What, what is the best time in your life? What day was it? Do you know what he's going to tell you? I think, I, I'm guessing. Outside, maybe. Second day, I think. Second day. Why? First day is misery. <laughs> Third day is salvation. But the second day is where he has the hope of salvation. It's where the, everything becomes clear for his life. He begins to understand how sinful he is. He, thought he was self-righteous. Right? 
he, he was living good. He, he loved God. That's why he's the man of God who's called to do the will, the will of God. He made some mistakes, but he couldn't acknowledge it. The second day, he be, everything becomes clear. And he said, all of this, he said, you could have killed me. You could have picked someone else. The, you, you had the mariners. He began to put everything together and began to realize, he said, well, what, what am I doing? And he said, I will. He knows he's going to leave. And he said, I'm going to worship. He said, but you still have Nineveh. He said, no, I will worship in your holy temple. I know. Because this revelation that this is what God wants from me, it happened to him, yes, it's sometimes in the lowest time in your life <laughs> and the lowest place. He was in the bottom of the whale. The whale went all the way down. No, no one else. No one to distract him. No mariners. No family. Nothing. <laughs> um, and I think that was why for him it was very special, very unique. Did he learn everything? Like, okay, after he went to preach, very good. The people can... Why did he stay around? Like, he could have taken a boat or found another fish. <laughs> I don't know. Like, why did he stay? He felt proud. He wanted to see the city destroyed. He wanted to, to see, he wasn't waiting to see the fruit of his labors. He wasn't working. He said, I did the work. Okay, this is my goal in life, and I did it, and I finished. Now what I do with my life? This is also what is um, some people, the fear of success. Well, what do I do next? You have to keep doing something better uh, because what is your challenge or goal in life? But Jonah's problem was still within him. And that's, what, that's why the book doesn't really end. Right? The book ends with us waiting. We're like, come on, Jonah, find God. Like it, we need you to get the answer. We need you, it has to be a happy ending. <laughs> for us. We know it doesn't really end well even for the Ninevites after their repentance. But for Jonah, we are waiting for that great work for God to do in him. And it's, it's meant that way because the people of Israel were rejecting others from the way of salvation and it's meant to be open so that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes that we see him for the salvation for all. That's when Jonah's like, yes, this is, this is the day that I have been waiting for. This is the day the Lord has made. So, so for us, we need that. Like I said, uh, some people, when they say, okay, well, I want to find. How do I find right now? I need to find the will of God for me. I said, okay, take three days. <laughs> find a boat. No, no don't, don't go on the, you don't need the boat. You need the fish, which is uh, seclusion with God in prayer and in fasting and in meditation with guidance. Um, and there's, there, usually we focus on Psalms or the, but, but this is the work um, we have been setting up uh, for some of the, usually graduates or college graduates, or, um, so that they can have these three days, but we put certain focus for each day. And the idea behind it is that we have to take time away from everything and everyone, just with God to hear his voice. I don't, I expect maybe some people will get it in a few hours and some people in a few weeks. <laughs> But, but in general, when we leave everything to hear, like we will not leave open and say, well, I didn't get anything. We used to do it in larger groups, and then when we find them talking to each other, we say, no, no, you, it's <laughs> just ru you ruined. <laughs> because th there needs to be a time of just direct communication with nothing else. When um, you see that uh, the other day we were reading about uh, St. Basil and St. Gregory, and they were talking about how they went to Pontus. They would take retreats there. Um, and St. Basil was complaining the first time how loud it was in the city and how much noise and distraction and hustle and bustle is in the city. I began to think like this. They didn't have anything after sunset. <laughs> and even for us, we were giving, like, even you don't know how much noise is when you are sleeping, how loud it is. <laughs> Until when you go to a place like this where there's, there's nothing, there's no cars. Uh, he was complaining, like if certain, enough people walk by, <laughs> it will be loud. Like where we have in our, uh, our uh, abbey, if a car goes by, I'll wake up. <laughs> because it's that quiet. But this, for them, 
like I said, that type of quiet, that solitude, that reflection, we need it in our dialogue and understanding with God. And if we don't actively, intentionally uh, make this time and effort, we won't be, we'll be like wandering and confused. So you want to find, you know, the difference between um, adults, successful adults, <laughs> and young adults, <laughs> is them knowing and understanding what is their purpose, their mission, their goals. And that's why, I, if I understand, I'm, I'm here for this, right? They will be um, very focused. And if something comes outside that, be like, doesn't, doesn't fit. If something is somehow related, we say, yes, this is, this, is, this is important. And so for us, in our journey then for tomorrow, we'll try to go quickly tomorrow, but how to reach that uh, so that we can find the understanding for our lives. Glory be to him now and ever into the age of all ages. Amen. You have no questions, right? I'm, I'm depending on what's like the answer. <laughs> I just always like to get the ball rolling but there's something that really struck me when your grace was talking about knowing my goal I feel that uh, we, I, most of the, the young men and women here are focused right now that some of the goals could be merely to med school mm -hmm. or and I'm not I don't have a problem with the goal but I think part of the issue is that the amount of effort nowadays to be successful and you know we're in a, in a society of Egyptian overachievers that we are it seems all our energy so is that in itself wrong because we we always encourage everyone to do their best but now it seems that their best means you have to sell your soul just you know, to have a chance at the application or to get the chance at that good career or all that. I'm wondering if your grace could speak to that because I, I could almost say for sure if I were looking at most of the people here, if you ask them what their goal in life, it's going to be in that career and not in that bigger picture that your grace is talking about. So I was just wondering if your grace could speak to that. Um. So it's, I think it's a result of us being first, second, are you third generation, any of your third generation? First and second generations, because this is one of the main reasons why our uh, parents or grandparents immigrated here, to give that. And, and because we were under a little bit, is this still being recorded? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but sometimes because when there's a generation that's been suppressed for so long, so then they'll focus on this, for success. But it is, as Abun is mentioning, I used to go to some of our uh, universities and discourage everyone from doing <laughs> medicine. Not because medicine is not important, but because I see the effects that it has on them in the application process in medical school and afterwards. Like, it really needs someone who's called to it very clear, and then usually for them, usually, I'm going to say it's easy, but it kind of goes very, like, naturally. There's a sacrifice and struggle, but it doesn't disrupt their lives so early and so long. Like you, you, if you are always in crisis mode <laughs> to get into medical school, most, most probably like double check with your <laughs> most That's not how it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, but the field itself has gone through its own um, difficulties. I remember when I was, uh, it was probably more clear when I was in college, um, uh, because 90% of the students were in pre-med, but it's just, it was a misery. And more than half, I would say, just did not get into medical school. They didn't go into medicine afterwards. So um, I said, like, it's, it is sometimes wasted energy and effort. I don't say, <laughs> I don't say too much, but I'm saying if you are, if you are, not, if you should be in somewhere else, and then it is. Like I said, it's, it's a lot of energy that could be used elsewhere. Many of you will become doctors, I don't doubt that, but you need to re-examine re in yourself, that's why I used to ask this a hundred times, why? 
like why medicine, why this type of medicine, why now and why you? And if you can't clearly say, then I would advise, <laughs> just look into, I would tell them, okay, make a plan that is solid. <laughs> just in case, 5% chance. Um, and I remember I had one of the youth uh, was with us uh, in college. And so I, I tried to tell him, no, what's your backup plan? And, say, and he had a backup plan. He was going to go to uh, pharmacy and then something else. And then went back into medical school. Um, and I kept asking, why? Like, why, why this delay? I didn't understand until he finished medical school. Um, he met his wife there. <laughs> had he got in before, <laughs> his life would be drastically different. So I said, okay, this makes sense. This is very situation doesn't usually happen that way uh, it happens the other way like you don't usually come back as a second or third career into medicine it doesn't happen um, but the more intentional and the more um, conscious you are about what you are doing and why then of course we give all the prayers all the support all the energy but I don't want someone trying to force because someone told me or this fits better, or I want this image, or this career, like, even when they're young. I say, why do you want to be a doctor? I'll make a lot of money. I said, you're not going to make a lot of money. <laughs> I know in the beginning, for a long time, pick something else. Like, if that's, if that's, because they're, they're raised from young. So, so I said, what are, it's some, some of it is our fault for not guiding them in the right way. Now I see a difference in, this, in the third or fourth generation. They don't all say medicine. Like, there is a shift. So, so, anyways, uh, you can speak with, you can, <laughs> yeah, it was the, what they call it, the, the educational trinity, the doctor, lawyer, engineer, and all others. <laughs> this is like outside, but, um. We're not going to leave you till to tomorrow, <laughs> then you tell, you tell us tomorrow. Oh, so, <laughs> so uh, man. Oh, oh, so you kept saying, you kept like, fasting and prayer, fasting and prayer, like, during the whole, like, like, sermon. So, like, I like, to, like, to, like, be good, to better yourself, you have to fast and pray. Especially, so there's something uh, very intentional so sometimes we fast and pray but not with intention because it's wednesday today's friday we're all fasting we pray we're supposed to pray but sometimes we don't pray with the intention not that we're always asking god for something but say if i'm focusing on virtue i'm focusing on <clears throat> um, god's will for me i'm focusing on the greatness of god but that my prayer is focused Usually when we are discovering or searching for the will of God, that's why I use the example of Jonah and for Moses, that fasting is, there is a special fast for discovering the will of God. That's what I'm speaking about. So when we pick those three days, um, if the timing is right, I usually tell them, okay, let's focus Jonah's fast on this. If it's in between a fast like now, okay, we'll dedicate a special fast. Um, <laughs> and one of the youth, he said, okay, I'm going to go and we set the time and we had a special monastery and he went and then um, so I called to make sure he was, he was he was on the way and then a couple hours later he called me and say, I said you know how, how can you you call me like they don't allow phones in this area did, I said did you get lost he said no 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 I found it but, but I left <laughs> I, said, I said why did you leave he said it's too quiet I couldn't <laughs> he couldn't function he wasn't prepared well enough to spend three days. He panicked, he left. Uh, but he still, found the, he still found the will of God. But what I'm saying, sometimes we're not ready to really start um, that, uh, spe to have that special time with God. Because if you do it correctly and really leave everything, it's life-changing. And it's something you will remember and keep for the rest of your life. And that's why I said fasting should be part of it. Yeah, so like that was just like it was just the same. I, like my question was that like, uh, can you like, like I know they're important, but like you you should always fast and pray. But can you always do like other things than fast and pray? There are then, other things, but we um, added 
<laughs> but fasting and prayer is part of our life for the rest of our life. But there's many other things, like, like whether it's reading and scripture and spiritual books, whether it's exercises that your father confession or spiritual guide will give you to do, uh, memorizing verses, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot. Um, but they're, they're directed, like even the readings and the exercises are directed for what you are experiencing, what you are going through now. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's good. They're they're tired. <laughs> they still have they still have uh, activities and food. Here. So, um, right now we're going to go downstairs. Activities are going to be downstairs. I'm going to kind of tell you guys what to do because it's going to be crazy trying to tell everyone downstairs. So downstairs, um, we can go down from here. There's a long table set up, so everyone take a seat at the table. And then from there, I will let you guys know what to do. Yes. And then dinner is pushed back a little bit. So... <laughs>